that you're joining us today for our Zoom in with JPro, Stay Fired Up Without Burning Out. My name is Laura Herman and I'm the Director of Program and Evaluation here at JPro. JPro is the organization that is of, by, and for Jewish nonprofit professionals across the United States and Canada. We're really excited that you're here for today's program. And I wanna share that our session is being recorded as you just heard and will be shared out on our YouTube channel afterwards. So if you miss anything or want to revisit um, or share this with other colleagues, feel free. Uh, we will also be sharing the series of slides that Fawn will be using in her presentation. And there is closed captioning available for this program that you can access by clicking on the more section at the bottom of your screen and then enabling the closed captioning. I wanna share a little, I wanna start us off by sharing a little bit about JPro's interest in this topic. We feel passionately about um, ensuring that, our, that professionals in our community have the resources and ability to navigate all of the challenges that we've encountered over the last couple of years. And we wanted to provide this session as a means for you as an individual professional to, to think about how you can manage burnout and how you approach your work um, and how you can do so with the type of energy that is required to work in our field. Um, our session is really designed to help you think about those issues for yourself personally. And we recognize that this is a collective issue. This is something that we all want to and are that we all need to be able to support each other better in managing burnout. So we hope that even though our session is designed for you as an individual professional, that some of the lessons that we discuss and questions that we'll address today can also help you think about how to support the rest of your organizations and your colleagues throughout this time. Um, I'm gonna ask my colleague, Laura, right now to share Fawn's bio in the chat so you can learn more about Fawn and uh, see what we'll be doing today. And as we begin, I'd like to invite you to take a moment to share in the chat a little bit about what brought you here today. Feel free to share a question that you have, what you hope to gain from the session, or anything else that moved you to take the time to be here. Um, we'll, we'll read those as they come in. And as Fawn presents, please also feel free to put your questions into the chat. Um, I don't think that we'll be, Fawn is going to do her best to address all of your questions, those that you um, indicated when you registered and that you'll be putting in the chat today. Um, and so please put those there so that I can ask Fawn and that we can see what you're thinking about. If you need anything else in terms of technical help or if you notice that your question hasn't been addressed, please also write to my colleague, Laura, whose Zoom name is labeled JPro Tech Help so that it's easy for you to identify. Um, and we'll be able to help you that way. Without further words of introduction, I am going to pass it over to Fawn now to lead us in this program. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, and thank you to all of you for being here. I, I know that you are sharing an hour of your time that you probably don't even have. Um, it goes without saying that you have been doing incredible work um, over the past couple of years, um, but it's certainly not lost, I don't think on any of us that, that all of you have been doing probably the job of more than one person, um, possibly at organizations that are maybe not as well resourced as you want them to be even before this pandemic. Um, and so I understand why so many people are really interested in this topic. You know, as, as Laura said, I'm gonna do my best today to try to um, cover as much as possible um, and answer as many of those questions that came in in advance. Um, given how many questions came in in advance, I hope you don't mind. We're going to be here for about six days. Um, um, I, I wish that we could. I wish that we were all in a room together and we could really sort of dig into this um, even longer. But um, I'm really going to try to cover as much as possible. Um, and, you know, just to sort of give you a bit of an overview of how we're going to do this and what we're going to hit on so you can kind of think about how the session's framed. 
Number one, I am gonna share some slides, but I'm gonna do my best to leave us on gallery mode for as much as we can, just because it's nice for us to feel like we're in conversation together. Um, I certainly hope that people participate in whatever way is comfortable for you. I know there are a lot of folks who are on this, but don't hesitate to take your microphone off mute if you wanna answer a question, ask a question. Um, it's more interesting to you, it's more interesting to me to hear more than one voice for the next hour, um, but certainly um, use the chat um, as well um, and we're gonna we'll do our best there. Um, in addition, I just wanna again, tell you sort of how we're gonna like, how we're gonna look at this because there are lots of ways to dive into this topic. Um, but in general, we're gonna think about it maybe in three different ways. We're gonna talk a bit about well-being you know, what you need to be doing for yourself to make sure this is sustainable. Um, but that's certainly not the only thing we're gonna talk about. I, I always, that's one of my pet peeves is that when you turn on the news or you turn on a national you know, morning news program and you hear people talking about burnout and the only thing they're talking about are strategies like taking a yoga class or taking a walk or meditating. And I believe in all those things. And we're gonna talk about those things that really matter to make sure that you have what it takes but that's not all we're gonna talk about. So we're gonna talk about well-being, and we're gonna start with that because it's incredibly important. And then we're gonna talk about some of those other contributors to burnout that a lot of times we don't think about, play, um, that they don't really, we don't really think that they play a role. We don't even realize how they're impacting us. So we'll talk about those. And then we're also gonna talk about sort of how you operationalize your day, right? What does the day look like and how might you make some adjustments that could make a difference for you? We're not gonna solve it all today. That's probably the only promise that I can make because I know that we all sit in different types of roles, different organizations. We have managers who are handling these issues differently. And of course our personal situations look, um, look very different. But what I hope you walk away with today is one, this normalization. A lot of times I've heard from a lot of folks working in um, all sorts of industries, but particularly in the nonprofit sector where you have this feeling like you're the only person who can't keep up, right? I'm the only person who sort of isn't managing this. Why, why is that? So one, I want us to really walk away feeling that you're not alone in this. Second, I want you to leave with very real takeaways, actionable. You're not gonna hear me talk a lot about theory today. It's really about things that you will hopefully be able to do at the end of the hour. Not everything is gonna resonate with you, but if you leave with a couple of new tools, strategies to try, might be something I suggest, might be something one of your peers um, suggests, that will be great. And the third is what I also really hope is that this winds up launching other sorts of conversations. Because the truth of the matter is, even if we were all together for a week digging into all these issues, at the end of the day, we're not in your workplace, right? Your workplace is unique. Your um, team dynamic is, is unique. And so what I hope is that this winds up helping you feel more comfortable, empowered, ready to have other sorts of conversations with your colleagues, with people who might report to you, um, with your manager. So aside from that, um, just the, those few things that we're gonna try and cover, what else, what will make this really valuable for you today? What else are you looking for? Feel free to take your microphone off mute or put those in the chat. I certainly saw the advanced questions, so I know a lot of the, the specifics that some people are looking for. Setting boundaries, yes. We could do a whole session on that, <laughs> but we will touch base about that for sure. Getting in touch with the fun aspects of my job. And while people are sharing those, I'll let you know that some of the themes that came out in the advanced questions were um, concerns about obviously the return to a physical workspace for those of you who are doing that in, in some sort of way. Um, other things you know, had to do with you know, expectations, right? When, when you work in the Jewish nonprofit community, um, there is a sense sometimes of written and unwritten expectations in terms of what our culture is and um, the sense of having to always say yes and be immediately responsive. Um, and that's a real, it's a real challenge. Um, yeah, so, so I see someone's writing about sort of that, that grind culture, right? Many of us, um, you know, feel like we are in organizations that don't have all the support to get everything done that we, that we need to get done. Um, yeah, and of course, you know, what's going on in your personal life? I see maintain motivation when there's so much expected both in work and outside of work. 
Okay, amazing. All right, I'm gonna keep an eye on those as they, as they come in. But to get us started, let me just share my screen with you and get us started to make sure we're all on um, the same page in terms of what we are, um, what we're talking about here when we talk about burnout. All right, so shopping cart. Why am I showing you a picture of a shopping cart? Um, well, number one, this is shopping carts at a fairly new supermarket that opened near me. So it makes my life a lot easier. I happen to really be very fond of this supermarket. But the reason I'm showing you the picture of a, of a shopping cart is because I think it really well illustrates for us um, sort of the difference between stress and burnout, because lots of us say we're burnt out, right? We say it all the time. The question is, are you really burnt out? So let me just throw out a scenario that you've all, all encountered before. You, go, you have to go to the grocery store, so you park your car in the lot, you grab a cart from outside, bring it inside the store, and it's only when you get about maybe 50 feet inside the store, like far enough that it would be a pain to go back out, and that's when you realize that you've got a bum cart. But you know what I'm talking about, one of those carts that only turns left, right? Or it's just really, really loud and everyone's sort of looking at you and you're thinking, oh, can I deal with this? And so you sort of think about, well, I only have 10 items on my list. I could probably manage this for a few minutes and just push this around the cart. It's too much of a pain, push it around the store, too much of a pain to go back at, right? Or you go, no, no way. I have 45 minutes worth of groceries, grocery shopping to do. I'm gonna have to go back out. So in a way, the difference between stress and burnout is stress is pushing that card around the store for about 10 minutes, right? We all know that stress is not a bad thing in and of itself. A lot of times it's really motivating. We get in that state of flow. We're really excited about what we're doing. We might have some pressure on us, but it's sort of just at the right amount that it keeps us motivated and keeps us focused. Burnout is when you feel like you're pushing that cart around the store for 10 hours a day, five, six, seven days a week. Right? It really becomes untenable. So burnout in its like simplest definition is really about having too many demands, too few resources, and not enough time to recover. Let me say that again. Too many demands, too few resources, and not enough time to recover. Anyone relate to that? Yeah, I see a lot of heads. Right, a absolutely. And so you've got to really think about, okay, Am I stressed out? Am I approaching burnout? Maybe I am already burnt out. And for all of us who are on this call today, there's probably a mix. But what we wanna do is obviously we wanna intervene before we get there. But before we get to the strategies, I feel like it's my responsibility to at least tell you, how do you look for it? How do you make sure you're keeping an eye on it in yourself and in your colleagues? Because it shows up differently in everyone. It can show up certainly in physical symptoms, right? That feeling where you just feel exhausted. You might've had a good night's sleep, but you don't Feel like you have the energy to get out of bed, right? Or you've stopped taking care of yourself. You're not, you're not doing the things that you used to do. You're not going to your doctor's appointments, but those physical symptoms, feeling very, very drained. Um, it shows up often in becoming a lot more cynical, right? You might've been the person who was always the cheerleader at work, the team player. Yeah, we can figure that out. We'll get that done. I know that's going to be hard. And suddenly you're like, yeah, that's never going to happen or that won't work. Or here we go again, why are we going to bother with this? And it also shows up in starting to feel less effective, right? We feel like we can make, we're making less of an impact. Um, and I find that particularly for um, people who work in the nonprofit arena, that's a big red flag, right? Because you didn't go into this work for the stock options, right? Let's be honest, right? You didn't go into this because you've got an annual trip to the Bahamas and you love going on that. You're doing this work because you feel a calling, a passion. It feels important to you, right? There's a real drive. And, and, and I should mention that that alone makes it harder for you to set those boundaries because you know that it's really important. And, you, and there are times where you know that if you don't do something, nobody else will, and a really important need is not gonna get met, right? So it makes it very hard, not only to set those boundaries, but it makes it hard sometimes to pay attention to those symptoms that you start experiencing that indicate that you need to intervene, that you need a break, that you need to adjust something so that you don't drive yourself into the ground. So any qu like questions about that I, before we sort of move forward into, into some of the strategies? I, I just wanted to make sure that we really sort of all understand how it shows up. And, and, it, and just so you know, those three different buckets, it can be in any order and you don't have to have all three of them. You might only have um, a couple, one or two of those symptoms, but pay attention to them. 
Any questions about that? All right, I'll, I'll keep an eye on. I'm going to keep us. I'm going to keep us moving. Normally, I would pause longer for questions, so don't hesitate to interrupt me, please, because I'm going to just keep moving so we can try and cover um, as as much as as much as possible. Um, and and if you want, you can certainly in the chat. I think this will um, really normalize things for folks. Just indicate sort of what are the red flags for you. When do you know that you are feeling uh, potentially um, overwhelmed and overextended? Because you want to sort of know that in your in yourself. Okay, so now I'm gonna have you do a quick little exercise. You can write on anything you have, a piece of paper, you can do it on your phone, as long as you promise not to check your email. Um, so I want you to think about your whole life, your personal and your professional life. And I want you to list your top three priorities in your life in order. Don't overthink this. Just jot those down. And then if you feel comfortable, go ahead and share those in the chat. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds, 45 seconds to do this. These are great, good. Give you another few moments. I think most people have them. I appreciate you all sharing. Okay, so now as you look at these, does anyone notice anything? Anyone notice anything missing? I think I saw it on one. So here's the question for you. Yeah, so someone wrote themselves, right. I, I saw one person put themselves on their list. So did anybody else put themselves on the list? Just show of hands. Notice very few people. So why weren't you on that list? And why weren't you number one on that list? You can take your microphone off mute. I try to make myself a, I mean, it is a priority for me, but I don't, I don't do anything about it. It always, okay. fall, I fall to the bottom or I get knocked off the list. Yeah. So, you know, it like in your head, I you know, know it. it, you know, you should be doing it, but actually executing on that's hard. Thank you, Laura. Anyone else? So I think in my case, it's actually the opposite. I've been going through so much that I am such a priority that it, to me was a given that, ah. and it's a given because of everything I've put in place based on the last two years. Um, and that's why, so it was, I only had two things and it was uh, family and, and health as in their health. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's but, but you do in fact prioritize yourself is what you're saying. Yes, so okay. much so that I think I didn't even, it's, it's Okay, but that's great. So you can be an example for, for your, your peers on this call because a lot of, a lot of people will say either everything else comes first. I have to take care of my family first. I have to take care of my job, right? We all have a myriad of responsibilities. Some of you have children. Some of you have elder care responsibilities. You might have, um, you know, other responsibilities in your community. You, you might be doing the job of five people right now. And so we know it, but we don't do it. I, I was once in a session and when I asked this question, a woman said, and she looked so distraught, she said, it it never even occurred to me to put myself on this list. And I'm sure that that resonates with some of you. So this is one of the most important takeaways of this entire session. That does not mean log off in a minute, okay? Stay with me. But I want you to think about this as one of the most important things you can do, not just that it's a nice thing to do, it's actually your responsibility. So here's the way to think about it. We all understand how banks work, right? Very simple, put money in, take money out, put money in, take money out. Sorry, I'm doing that the wrong way. Um, but if you continue to take money out and you haven't been putting money in, we all know what happens, you become overdrawn. That's a problem. The same thing is true in our own lives, right? People in our lives are colleagues, clients, our manager, 
kids, parents, siblings, people are making withdrawals from us all the time. And in no way am I suggesting those are bad things. That's actually what makes our life really interesting, really enriching. The problem isn't always so much that there's so many withdrawals, it's that we're not making deposits. And so try to shift thinking about this as something that's nice to do. I'll try to find the time to do it. We ever say that, right? I'll find time, I'll try to find time, right? Instead, think about it as a responsibility because it is a responsibility. How in the world are you supposed to show up you know, at your, J at your JCC, at your synagogue, at your school on any given day and be able to be as creative and productive and professional as you want to be, as you need to be, if you've let yourself get completely depleted, right? It's just impossible. So it's actually a professional responsibility to do this for yourself. And again, this is about making time, not finding time. So now we're gonna do another little quick exercise. Uh, Fawn, before yeah. we get to that exercise, um, I just wanna highlight one thing that's come up in the chat that's not yes. necessarily a question, but I'm gonna read what Galia wrote. And yes. um, Galia says, it's more stressful to neglect the other things in my life to focus on myself than it relieves my stress to focus on myself. And it seems like there are a lot of people for whom that the same thing I, idea resonates. And I'm wondering if you can speak to that a little bit as well. Yeah. So I just want to make sure I got that. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find it because it's easier for me to see it. So, so say this again, that it's, e oh, it's, it's oh, more stressful to neglect other things in my life to focus on myself than it relieves my stress to focus on myself. Ah, I see. Okay. So Sometimes that is true, hundred percent. And I think that that does resonate. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Galia. But I think sometimes we don't realize how much more effective and how, how it will relieve our stress once we do start to take better care of ourselves. And keep in mind that sometimes what this runs in, what, what we were running into is that we feel that taking care of ourselves is defined a particular way, right? I've got to take an hour walk, right? Or I have to take a certain amount of time off right? It may be more about 10 minutes here. It might be more about changing certain small habits that just prioritize your own health and well-being so that it doesn't feel stressful. Because let's be honest, some of us do have very, very demanding lives, not just pro professionally, but personally. And it's hard. And certainly depending on what the, the stage of your life, what stage of, of life you are in, this might be easier or it might be harder. You know, I certainly remember that when my own children were much younger, right? When all five, when all three of them were under the age of the four and under, right? It was far more stressful to take time for myself than it was to deal with all of all of those things. All, you know, all of the other things that I needed to do to take care of my, to take care of myself. So, think about you know, do I have to sort of think rethink how it is that I care for myself? And so on those on that on that note. We're going to do a little exercise because I want you to think about this very issue. So I, Dahlia, I really appreciate you, you raising this. So we're going to take one minute. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to get up and move. Now, the, the only rules here, number one, hopefully everybody has pants on. If you don't, you can turn your camera off. But come back in just one minute because we don't have a lot of time. So I want you to get up and you can do anything you want to move. You can do laps around if you're in your house. In your, in your workspace, you can do some stretches or some push-ups under your desk, go pet the dog. And then when you come back, come back and write in the chat what you did. And if you want to, a word or two about how it felt. All right, one minute, let's go. All right, I see some folks got themselves some water. 
some walking in place, some jumping jacks, stretching. All right, good. Brittany said it felt good. Okay, went to my office, good. A lot of people hydrating, that's awesome, okay. Oh, someone emptied my dishwasher, but it felt good. All right, that's moving and accomplishing something, excellent. Okay, so why did I have you do this? It's probably pretty obvious to you. Many of you sit all day long. You don't take breaks. We're not designed to do that, right? You think about, think about your um, Olympic athletes. Right? They don't train hard all the time. They interval train, right? They train hard and then they take a break to recover because their muscles have uh, created little tears. And then during the recovery period, they rebuild themselves much more strongly and then they train hard again. Our brain is, it, it sort of operates the same way. Our brain is not designed to keep going without taking a break approximately every 90 minutes or so, give or take. That doesn't mean you need to take a long break, but it does mean you need to get up and you need to do something different. Um, you need to, you know, take care of yourself. You need to stretch. You need to get some, some water. Um, I'm laughing here that Gaia is at her grandmother's and now we have inspired her grandmother to do some lunges as well. Amazing. Okay. So there are really, when we think about making sure that we have the energy that we need to do the work that's necessary at our jobs, there are really three non-negotiables. Exercise, getting enough rest, and doing anything that fuels you. So I'm gonna move through this really quickly because I want us to get to some of the other strategies, but this is extremely important. So I know that if I asked all of you, how many of you feel like you get enough sleep on a given night, the majority are going to say they don't. Some will, but this is one of the biggest game changers for you, right? I remember when I was a kid, my mom used to go to bed at about nine o'clock, 9.30, and everybody knew not to call our house after that hour. I was so embarrassed by this. I felt like the biggest dork when I was a teenager. Now I've told her, you were so wise. I get it now. I totally get it, right? We all know that feeling when we've had enough rest. So why am I talking about this? Because you know those feelings when you come in the next day and you haven't had enough sleep or you've had several days where you haven't sort of taken care of yourself, haven't had enough rest. Those are the days when the stressors become more significant than they need to be, right? We don't handle them as well. That is when we, we sort of, you know, get a little bit more irritated more easily. That's when we can't make those connections that we need to in, in meetings. We get very frustrated. Everything takes longer. So make sure that you're take, getting enough rest. I suggest trying to just even move, you know, set an alarm so that tonight, 15 minutes before you normally head upstairs or head into, head into your bedroom, that you set an alarm so that you do it 15 minutes earlier, okay? So to get yourself, you know, um, to, to sort of change sort of some of those habits. Exercise, as mentioned, one of the reasons we don't exercise is because we think we have to do it a certain way. You don't have to do CrossFit, I promise you that. If, if three 10 minute walks works for you, fabulous. If the way that you're gonna do it is by signing up for a spinning class and committing some money to it, and that's how you're gonna keep at it, that's great. But the idea is to do something that you're going to really stick with. And then the idea is to do something that fuels you. Think back to before COVID, when you used to go out a whole lot more, and let's just say it's a Sunday morning, you've had brunch with friends at 11 o'clock in the morning. And what does everybody say after that brunch, when that brunch is over and they're saying goodbye? What's everyone say? I know you know this. Anyone? That was so nice. So, so I said again? Uh, Susan, can you say it again? I'm sorry. It's time for a nap. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> oh, I say that was so nice. <laughs> Yes, yes. Okay, so probably both are true. Susan, totally fine. Susan's getting her sleep and she took that really seriously. Thank you, Susan. And yes, Bethany, 100%. So many of us say that was amazing. We should do that more often. Yes, I see a few people wrote that in. So we haven't been able to do that. And, and maybe some of us still aren't comfortable doing some of those things. But think about what are those things that fuel you that you that you maybe haven't been doing as often. And it might be as simple as taking a walk with a neighbor. It might be a, a, a regular phone call that you have with your brother who lives across, uh, you know, across the country from you. But doing those things makes a big difference to sustaining ourselves. Those are the non, those are the non-negotiables. So I'm going to ask you very quickly, and then we're going to pivot to some of the, the very specific work strategies. 
But, but before you do this, because I know you're all thinking, oh, these are great ideas. I'll, I'll do something like this. But what's going to happen is the end of the hour is going to come and you're going to immediately jump right back into your work. So I want you to be committing to this now. I want you to create what I like to refer to as a 10 day challenge for yourself because it takes a while to build habits. So again, pull out your phones or your calendar. Again, don't check your email, but I want you to put something on your calendar, something that you're gonna do differently around, around these non-negotiables that have to do with taking care of yourself. And if it makes sense, create it as a non negotiable sorry, as, a, as a, re a recurring event, right? So it might be that bedtime alarm. It might be, um, you know, that you're going to put, you know, it might be that, you know, uh, you're going to change that snack that you have at 3 p.m. every day from a bag of chips to a piece of fruit. Uh, it might be scheduling some breaks in your, cal in, in your, you know, daily calendar to get out and walk. So go ahead and just do that. And then if you feel comfortable, go ahead and share um, in the chat what it is you're going to do, what you're committing to. going to bed earlier, taking an actual lunch break, good for sure, lunchtime, swimming, There's a lot of people trying to walk, good getting rid of the 2 p.m. caffeine fix so that maybe you can sleep a little better at night, reading before bed, 10 minutes walking. You know what I love about some of these? They're doable. You, you have not, you have not overcommitted. Good, these are small things. And so the idea is that you wanna build on these. Awesome, calling friends more often, setting alarm for 9 p.m. Good, okay, so hopefully if you see someone on here who you know, hold them accountable, hold each other accountable. It makes a really big difference. So, so any questions about this piece of it in terms of sort of that energy piece and, and making sure that you're taking care of your well-being before we pivot to some of the, the work strategies, specific work strategies? I know it's a lot of information really fast. All right, I'm gonna keep an eye, but go ahead and, and jump in at, at any point. So, so now as we start talking about those, you know, what happens in the workplace, this is in a lot of ways much more challenging because there's so many variables, right? When it comes to your own well-being, you have a lot more control over what you can do. In the workplace, you are in a, uh, an, an environment where there are other people who are very much impacting sort of what your day-to-day -day experience is like, um, the demands, how well staffed your organization is, how well everybody is navigating, whether it's a return to a physical workspace, whether it's a hybrid environment, there are lots of things. And many of those pieces can actually be large contributors to burnout, those things that we don't always have as much control over. When, when I find that when we talk about burnout, particularly in um, the nonprofit community, we talk about it being the result of overwork and many, many hours. And 100%, that is, in fact, the largest contributor to burnout. However, there are many other factors that can really be big drivers of burnout. Not all of them do we have complete control over. Um, some of them we would want other people to be managing better, but we can sometimes play a role in these. And I'm going to share in a moment. Um, a slide with you that shows you some of these. But I think what's important to understand, and I would say, you know, if you have to find some silver lining in this pandemic the past couple of years, for me, it's the fact that burnout has always, or preventing burnout, has always been a shared responsibility between employee and employer, right? It's not one person's responsibility to, uh, to fix this. But the conversation wasn't around that, right? Prior to COVID, it was a lot about this well-being, what we were talking about before, take a yoga class, you know, bring in, you know, people who can do massages during the day. You know, you've heard all of these things as well. They're all great. If someone wants to come and give me a massage today, that would be great. However, um, the, you know, at, at the end of the day, um, now, because of COVID, many, many more organizations are looking at this much more seriously. And we're recognizing that it's a two-way street and there's a lot that has to be, there has, a lot has to be put in place in order to really prevent burnout. So let me share my slide with you um, so that you can see what some of these are and see where you actually can um, play a role in preventing um, some, of, some of this burnout or at least addressing some of it. 
So there's the boundaries piece. I'm not going to dive into that yet because we're going to we're going to get to that in a little bit. But burnout sometimes happens. Well, let, let me back up for one second. Let me say one other thing to frame this. We often think about preventing burnout by removing things that are causing stressors for us, right? The extra work assignment, the manager who isn't managing us very well. We, we think about removing things. We also want to think about adding things that actually act as buffers to that stress. And so some of these fall into that, that, that category. So when we think about job alignment, something that probably most of you don't think about on a day-to-day -day basis, when you don't have a good alignment between what it is that you do every single day as an as, as employee, as a professional, um, when there's not good alignment between what you do, what you're good at, what you were hired to do, what, what, what you're excited about, you are far more likely to be burnt out. So when all of you think about the past couple of years, many of us have found that our job alignment is a little bit out of whack. And, and some of that is, is gonna remain that way for a little while, right? It might be because organizational priorities had to change as a result of the pandemic. It may be that it's always been an issue where you have a manager who's always throwing things your way because you are the go-to team player. You're always willing to say yes. And now 60, 70% of what you're doing is no longer what you were hired to do. You might be in a position where your organization had to let some folks go or people were furloughed. And so you're picking up additional responsibilities. So you may not be able to fix this entirely or fix it immediately, but it is an important thing to look at and to say, wow, how much of that might be playing into how I'm feeling? My job is a lot harder because I'm doing things that, you know, that, are, that require a lot more effort from me or they don't excite me quite as much. Same thing with role clarity. For many of us, does anyone ever feel this way? And I'm gonna just, I'm just gonna take this slide off. You're, you're gonna get this, but I'm gonna take the slide off so we can, we can see each other here. But does anyone ever feel as if you go into work, whether you're going in or not going in, but you start your work day and work feels a little bit like a moving target? Like not, yeah, I see, I see some really emphatic head nodding here, yes. So that's exhausting. That, that's okay periodically. But if that's a regular occurrence for you, that's gonna create a lot of, of, of stress. It's gonna create a lot of extra work. And what happens is that in an ideal world, our managers are helping us with those priorities. But a lot of times with no bad intentions, our managers are overwhelmed. They have a lot of pressures themselves. They may not even realize how many additional things have been added to your plate. And so here's a place where we can initiate a conversation with the person that we report to, to get some of that clarity as to what we're supposed to be doing. Right? Where if I pretend that Rebecca is my manager, I can say, Rebecca, could we grab 15 minutes, 20 minutes later this week? I just want to talk about the priorities that we had laid out for the first half of 2022. Right. And then during that conversation, I might be able to say, you know, as I know you you realize that we had prioritized these three, these three programs. But since that time, we've added a couple more. The board wanted us to do this, or we're responding to. Um, the situation in Ukraine, and now we're, you know, now we're doing, you know, this additional program. I just want to make sure that we're on the same page, that we're aligned in where it is that I should be spending my time, my energy, and which items might need to be backburnered, or which items might need an adjustment in our timeline. And what I find a lot is that people are reluctant to have this conversation because we don't want to appear as if we don't want to work hard. Right? We don't want to appear as if we don't want to do all the work. And we want to obviously always be demonstrating that we're adding value, that we're a team player. It is not unprofessional to initiate this conversation. It's actually very professional and really your responsibility to make sure that you're on the same page. Because otherwise what's going to happen, especially if you are someone who's very driven, a real top performer, is you are going to try to do all of those uh, responsibilities and address all of those priorities at 100%. And that might be fine for a week, but that's not sustainable. And that's a situation that's really going to contribute to burnout. So really think, are you someone who's sitting right now with maybe some lack of clarity around that, around those priorities and a conversation or conversations with your team, with your manager might really help and take some of, take some of the pressure off of you. Um, some of the other pieces, we're not gonna walk through all of the different blocks on that screen, um, on the slide that I put up, but a couple other pieces. Many of us are feeling, you know, just an, a lack of learning. We, we haven't been going to the same conferences that we normally go to. We haven't maybe had opportunities to 
job shadow in our, in our um, organization or to sit in collaborative meetings where we learn and grow in different kinds of ways. So are there things that you can just do for yourself to get some professional development, whether it's taking an online class, whether it's having some conversations with other people who maybe are further along professionally in your field and you wanna learn about how they got there. It might just be setting aside 20 minutes once a week to read some articles that really help you learn. But making sure that you're getting that, that professional development is a really good buffer to a lot of stress. The other um, piece that I wanna call out from some of these other contributors to burnout are our own habits or our beliefs. Some of us are in fact in cultures where the culture has been established, where we feel like it's, it's imperative that we respond at all hours during the day, right? Whether it's six o'clock in the morning, 11 o'clock at night, we have to quickly respond to emails. We have to always be you know, sort of focused on that quick response time. Um, that is a, a challenge. I mean, it's a larger organizational challenge, but for some of us, we have to recognize that we're doing that because that's our belief. That's not necessarily what the expectation is. And to really consider what might happen if I you know, let my team know, or maybe I just start changing my behavior a little bit. And I say at seven o'clock, I'm not responding to, to email messages. Right. And I let let key people that I work with know that if there's something urgent that comes up, that they can reach me by text. So thinking about are there certain habits that you can change that are maybe not really expected of you, but are contributing to your stress? Do you have perfectionist tendencies? Are you trying to do everything at 150 um, percent? I know some of you are probably saying, yeah, that's me. Right. So, again, some things need to be done at 150 percent. Some of them maybe could be fine at 70% and that would really be okay. So can you, when you sit down to start a project, to start an initiative, really ask yourself that question, what type of effort does this need? And, 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 and approach, it in, in that particular, approach it in that particular way. Um, so think about your own habits, you know, your own beliefs and how you might make some, make some changes there. One of the things you're probably starting to pick up on is that I'm suggesting that you really approach your work being very, very intentional, right? Being really thoughtful rather than triaging. Does anyone ever feel like they're just sort of triaging their way through the day? Just being very reactive to what's coming at you. And for many of us, that's the nature of part of our job. We do have to be responsive but we may be being more reactive than we have to. And we can really be more thoughtful in, in how we actually plan our day and sort of operationalize it. So Matt, let me just ask you a question. For anybody who's ever taken um, small kids bowling, little kids bowling, like eight and under, what will make or break that experience of taking little kids bowling? You know what it is. Yes, I came right out, bumpers. I knew, and snacks, it's, snacks always comes up as well. Sometimes I hear snacks first, but bumpers for sure. Absolutely. So bumpers, right? It's miserable if you're with kids and the whole day, the whole time you're bowling, their, their ball is in the gutter. So I share this because it's something that's easy for us to remember. We need bumpers too. We need boundaries on our own day. And so we have to be really thoughtful about how we plan and actually, even before we plan our day, how we actually prepare for our day. So let me show you a, a few things that, that, you can, that you can do. One is really thinking about how you start off in the morning. Now, I know that many of you, the first thing that you do is you grab this. You're lying in bed. You haven't even, you have barely even opened your eyes and you're reaching over to your nightstand to grab your cell phone. I understand that. And there are going to be some days that maybe you need to, right? Maybe you have an eight o'clock conference call that you are managing and you need to make sure nothing blew up the night before. Okay, I'm going to give you a break. Go ahead and check your email first thing in the morning. But what happens the moment that you check your messages in the morning? I saw some expression. Bethany, what was, what, can you, do you mind sharing what that, what that meant? Uh, my brain is on and I'm working. Yes, exactly. That's exactly right. Even for those of you who say, and I know some of you are saying it right now, right now you're thinking, yeah, but I only look, I don't respond. Okay. Yes, I know that might be true. But as Bethany just said, all of a sudden your head is just in a different space. 
So try to start your day a little bit differently. How you start your day really can make a very big difference on how you handle all of that, all of those stressors, all of those demands that are on you from your colleagues, from your lay partners, from your customers and clients. So think about, for, for those of you who maybe have more flexibility in the morning, you might be able to work out for an hour. Others of you may have 10 minutes. That might be all you get, but do something that you love. If you've got a little child at home, maybe spending 10 minutes uninterrupted on the floor reading a book to your four-year-old, maybe that's the best way to start your morning. For someone else, it might be going out and just taking a quick 20-minute walk or making a call to your dad. But think about really intentionally, how do I just sort of set the day for myself before I get into the work? Because you know the work is coming. The next is to think about when you're most productive. And this is where you've, some of you have heard me talk before about really focusing much more on energy management rather than time management. So what does that mean? We all have an energy cycle. We all have times of the day when we are sort of more focused. We're able to just be much more productive. If I were to ask you right now, many of you would probably say your most productive time is in the morning, uh, but not everybody is going to say that. The key is knowing when it is for you and to try to structure your day in a way that allows you to protect that as best as possible. It doesn't mean that you're always going to be able to, right? If the donor asks you for a meeting at 9 a.m., um, do not throw me under the bus and tell them that this woman Fawn said that I'm allowed to protect that time and I'm not gonna meet with you. That's not a good idea. However, if one of your teammates asks you for nine o'clock, you don't necessarily have to give them nine o'clock unless it's really critical that that's when they need to meet with you. You can suggest, might, you know, do you have any time in the afternoon that's a little bit better for me, right? Try to protect that time, try to block it on your calendar so that when you need to do those, that more strategic work, the work that requires more focus, less interruptions, you're actually able to get it done. How does this play into burnout? I'll tell you how it plays into burnout is because you all know about that feeling at 5, 6 p.m. when you realize it's the end of the day, you realize that you've been working nonstop all day. And yet you're looking at your to-do list and you're saying, how is it possible that I did not accomplish my most important priorities? How did that happen? And part of it is because you didn't protect your time. Part of it is because there is a lot of inbound coming at you and you're wired. You are probably very much wired to be responsive, to be a team player. Somebody asks for help and you say yes, right? Someone, someone needs something. And there are times that you need to do that because you don't work in a vacuum, you work in an organization. But again, think about being intentional about, okay, when is it that I do need to set those boundaries? And, and am I actually doing that in a, in a very, very deliberate way? Then think about how you're bookending your day, right? So we, we've talked about the beginning, that's the first, that's one bookend. The other is, how do I know that I'm finishing my day? We all know that that work and personal life has, you know, it was already blurred before COVID. It's become unbelievably blurred. So how do I make sure that I know that it's a signal to, to end my day? You know, do I set an alarm? Do I have to have an activity that I've committed to, whether it's dinner with a friend or if I'm at home, it's, you know, I, I've given my family permission to bang on the door until I come out, you know, wh whatever it might be, but really have a set time so that you can start to make that transition. All of this is far easier if you are prioritizing well. Brutal prioritization is key. Um, because otherwise everything really seems like a priority. And several of you wrote that in the chat that you um, sometimes you know, feel like everything is a priority. And part of it is getting that clarity from your manager, but part of it is also being very intentional about how you, you, know, about how you do things. And, and some of you might be saying, yeah, Fawn, that's, that's great. Um, but how do I do that when um, someone's always been, something's always being asked of me, right? Because I'm going to skip a couple slides here. Do you ever feel like this, right? Where you are saying yes, right? You hear it. You hear your, you hear the words coming out of your mouth, but inside you are saying, no, 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 no. I totally don't want to do this. Yeah. And why is it, why is it that we say yes, when we really want to say no? I know some of you are thinking, because I don't know how to say no, you can send it in the chat, expectations, some guilt. 
yeah, sometimes we, we sometimes we say yes because we feel as if, yeah, people pleasing, and that's how we're going to be a team player. Okay, and someone wrote, Mariana wrote, feeling responsible. I'm glad you wrote that because here's what I want you to sort of maybe flip upside down a little bit when you think about being responsible. Your responsibility is to do the work that you were hired to do, right? Your responsibility is to address those priorities which you and your manager have determined are the biggest priorities. And that doesn't mean that other things aren't gonna come up that you're gonna have to pivot to. We all have to step up at, at times, absolutely. But it is also your responsibility to make sure that that key work gets done. It's your responsibility to make sure that it's getting done, not at 11 o'clock at night, day after day after day, because that's not going to be sustainable. That's not that's not an that's not a value add to your organization. That's not a value add add to your well being or to the other family or friends who are who are counting on you. So we have to actually set those boundaries, and it's a lot easier when we're really clear on what those priorities are. So. Many of you may already have prioritizing models that you use. Um, and if you have something that works for you, that's amazing, stick with that. For those of you who aren't sure, what I usually suggest people do is think about a model that's really about high payoff and low payoff activities, right? Is it a high payoff or is it low payoff? And that means for both your work and your personal life, right? So the high payoff at work are obviously those programs, those initiatives that you, your manager, your team, um, have determined are most critical right now, those deliverables. The high payoff personally might be exercise, right? It might be helping a, a parent who you have care responsibilities for. But what, what are those high payoff items? Now, the low payoff items, they're not necessarily things that you can just not do. I mean, some of them might be, but think about there are things that maybe you can just do, do those at a low energy time, right? For those of you who are a little bit tired after lunch, right? I always have about 30 minutes scheduled in where I can do things like return emails. I can do invoicing, things that don't require a lot of brain power. They have to get done, but I'm not going to dedicate my most critical, my, sort of my, my high energy time to get those done. So really think about you know, how you clarify those, those priorities. And when you're asked, when you're asked um, to do something, how do you think about it? You know, what, what, do, we what do we have to do to actually um, sort of sort it out in our head? Is this something I wanna say yes or wanna say no to? Because one of the ways that we often get into trouble is that we answer right away. And then we've committed to things that are really things that we're not, we, don't ha we didn't have to commit to. We didn't, now we have these extra things on our plate and we're going to have to spend time doing those when we have other things that are more important to do. So think about slowing down when somebody asks you to do something. Get more information. Ask them, you know, maybe somebody asks you, they say, hey, you know, Amanda, we would love to have your voice at the table. Could you potentially join this working group um, on this new program that we're putting together? And rather than just say yes or no, you're probably screaming in your head, no, 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 no. Ask about it. Can you tell me how often are you going to meet? What's involved in between those sessions? Um, what else is gonna be expected of me? Ask them if you can give some time to take a look at your own, your own um, you know, uh, all the items that are on your list right now to see whether or not you can commit to it. Say, I wanna make sure that if I commit to this, I actually have the, the time to follow through on it. You may decide that you, that you can, maybe you decide this is really interesting. You've learned more and now you wanna do it. You might be able to say, I actually can't commit to this, or another thought is you might be able to actually um, suggest that you can offer help in some other way. I can't commit to attending every single meeting, but you know what? If there's some particular meetings that you're having where my voice might be helpful, it might be useful to have me there, let me know. I'm going to do my best and I'll put those on my schedule. And that way you are you know, um, you know, offering some, you know, some, some yes, but not all yes. Um, but, but in order to do that, we have to really slow, slow down. Um, as someone else said, also, you can, another way to help is to say, I actually don't have time to do it, but you know, this is something where Russ actually has some experience, and I think he'd be look really excited for an opportunity like this, right, Russ? Um, so <laughs> so um, you know, you're not going to actually you know, assign it to somebody else, but you might be able to suggest a different way to help. Um, so these are some of the things that actually can help you day-to-day -day operationally. As mentioned, you want your manager's partnership in these, and some of you might really have that. For some of you, you might have to take a little bit more of the initiative yourself 
to have some of these conversations around scheduling, around boundaries, around priorities. But don't relinquish control to everybody else. Think about these issues that we were talking about where there are places that you might be able to make some adjustments to your schedule in your work day and with your work priorities that could really make a big difference for you. I wanna be very, very mindful of, of time. So I wanna ask, ask and say a couple things in, in closing here. First is I would love to hear whether it's something else someone else suggested or something that I said today, what for you is that takeaway? Something that you're gonna to try today, um, you know, starting today to do that might make a really big difference or maybe a small difference um, in how you're feeling in, in terms of being overextended and, and, and overwhelmed. I want to remind you that this doesn't change overnight. You didn't get to where you are you know, in one moment um, and it's gonna take a while to, to rewind it and to, to make some of these changes in your habits um, and, and how you work. So be patient with yourself, pick one or two things at a time um, and, and then build on from there. Um, the last thing I will say is, I know that this today did not answer everybody's questions. Um, um, I, I hope that for those of you who are gonna be at the conference, um, we'll have a chance to, to dig into this a little bit more. If anyone has a burning question that they didn't get a chance to ask, they can absolutely follow up with me directly after the session. I'm really happy, I'm happy to engage that way. Um, and the, the, the second to last thing that I'm gonna say here is I do periodically send uh, send out a newsletter with some very quick tips on, on preventing burnout. If that's something that interests you, by all means, let me know, just send me an email. Um, and um, the last I will say is just thank you. Thank you for all that you are doing for our community. Um, it, is, um, it is just tireless work sometimes, um, sometimes not always as outwardly um, acknowledged as, as um, we all should be acknowledging it, but it is um, amazing what all of you do. And um, I wish you just lots of, of good luck going forward with all that you're doing. And thank you for sharing your time today. Juan, thank you so much. Um, you, you know, you said thank you to us, but I really owe a big thank you to you on behalf of myself and the entire JPRO team. Um, you shared lots of amazing things for us to think about. I'm leaving wanting to have so many more conversations with my colleagues and partners around this issue to learn about the way that they manage their time and energy so that I can better support them and think about how we work together as a team. Um, so really such a deep and big thank you. Um, before you all hop to your next thing, which I know will come immediately, although I do hope you get a stretch break, um, I'd like to invite you to share your feedback on today's session. My colleague, Laura, will put a link to our feedback form in the chat. And one quick announcement on behalf of the JPRO team, we have a couple of upcoming Spotlight Master Classes um, that my colleague will also put a link to in the chat. There is one on data visualization that is at the end of March and at the beginning of April, there'll be one on making the ask um, about fundraising. So we hope that you'll join us for one or both of those. And um, again, it's been so great to see all of you and we're really grateful and honored that you took the hour of your time today to spend with us.